And welcome to Libertarian Counterpoint. With me today is Jason McPhee from the Knuckleheads of Liberty podcast. And Jason, today we're going to talk about, we're going to start off with free speech and mental health, which are actually two issues that are strongly important to me and they frankly should be important to everybody because what this, uh, it was a blog post from a mental health professional and she was pointing out that if you don't have the ability to speak freely, if you censor yourself, it actually has a negative impact on your, on your mental health because you're not being true to yourself. You're not being who you really are. And that's, a, uh, if you actually think about it, it's fairly obvious, right? That essentially living a lie is going to <laughs> negatively impact your mental health, but yet we don't think of it that way, yeah. now do we? No, it doesn't seem like we do, but uh, yeah, that just seems like one of the many benefits of free speech. I, you know, gosh, I mean, I think about so much of the, the the terrible polarization we're having here and it seems like some people's answer is to eliminate the speech they don't like but uh, it, it seems it, if we can just have a little more tolerance to hear other people's ideas uh, then we can I, I think it'll just make society healthier which will also uh, impact everybody's uh, mental health a little better too but certainly people not having to feel like they have to hide their ideas like uh, you know we, we currently see uh, certainly uh, college campuses are a place where where that's been pretty apparent uh, uh, you see that in a lot of places if, if you happen to have conservative ideas uh, you almost have to fly under the radar at a lot of these colleges <laughs> so. yeah, and and do you actually get it halfway, right? You know, well, if you're not allowed to be your true selves, whether it's a transgender issue or, a, you know, the issue with um, LBGTQ, whatever it is, they know that they're not allowed to live them, their true selves. Something's going to be negatively, the, their lives are going to be negatively impacted. Their emotional and mental health will be negatively impacted. But if you, but on the same foot, they don't think about the people that have a vastly different view of the world than they do not being allowed to express themselves will have that same negative impact. And so essentially we've lived in a world where we're deliberately having negative impacts on the people around us to protect ourselves rather than make ourselves stronger so that when we have when we hear things and see things that don't like ourselves that we don't like, we are stronger in the face of that. They don't harm us. They don't cause us distress. Instead of having trigger words and so we have to go hide from our trigger words, we say, I don't like that, but I'm strong enough as a human being to be able to just go about my life. I'm not so negatively impacted because somebody else have a, has a different view of the world. Yeah, and it almost seems ironic that the, uh, the evolution of these safe spaces on college campuses uh, to essentially protect people's, uh, I guess, mental health was the guise of it, right? I mean, people felt threatened, so therefore you have to have a safe space. Well, I, I guess on the flip side, you're, you're kind of threatening other people because you're literally telling them that uh, their ideas are so offensive to you that you can't bear to hear them. <laughs> yes, I can't so. hear them. You can't because I can't hear them. You can't say them. So yes. now because I don't want to I want to be able to live my life freely without being impacted by your views. Now you have to be impacted by my views. And, and so we live in this world where, you know, where everybody seems to well, not everybody, far too many people will qualify that seem to think that my I get to live free but in order for me to live free you don't get to live free rather than you know we all get to live free and that means it's going to be messy on the fringes it's going to be messy when we interact with each other and we're just going to have to figure out as human beings as individuals how to manage that and how to protect our mental health because otherwise we're just going to watch this mental health death spiral that we've kind of yeah. we're watching society not just here in America worldwide we're having a serious uh, mental health problem. And it was already existing, we'll say, before you know, the lockdowns and COVID and everything that has happened past that. But ever since, you know, the repercussions of that have been tremendous, from our youth all the way to the elderly who have been locked away in their homes or in, mental, or in their care facilities, unable to see their families the way they used to. Oh, I was going to say, too, it is kind of interesting. There's a, a slight tangent to all this, too, but it's not just being free to say what you want to say, but they, they, there's literally a push to force people to say things in certain ways, such as the whole pronoun game that we're in right now, where people feel the need that they actually have to use these pronouns. Now, it's fine if somebody wants to use them, but the idea that some people feel pressured to use them as well is kind of an interesting aspect of all of this as well, too. But there's, so. a, there's a bullying aspect, even if yeah. the intentions are good. And we'll say, yeah. that even if the intentions are good, there's still a bullying aspect of forcing somebody else to use words in a way that they don't want. Mm -hmm. And 
and you know we have to understand that those are dangerous long term that it's a really dangerous long term not just for our mental health but you know for our society at large because you know if 25 30 percent of a population is suffering from mental health problems you've got a serious problem in your in your communities and that will impact the way we work the way we live you know our economy and everything else and it's a it's no surprise to me that as we watch our, ment our mental health deteriorate, we're also watching the, uh, f our commitment to free speech deteriorate. They are connected, right? No matter chicken or egg story, but they are connected, and I think that's kind of clear. And so we're going to move on. Uh, why Democrats want to end this retirement loophole? The Roth, what is it, the Roth, what is it? What the heck? I've got Roth all these, IRA. Yeah, the Roth, the Roth IRA. I'm getting numbers. Yeah. And you start getting all these tax loopholes and tax deferments, and I don't even—they're not loopholes. The government wants you to behave a certain way, and that's mm -hmm. why they pass these these kind of laws. They want you to save. In this case, they wanted people to save more money, so they created this Roth IRA. And now, what? Twenty years later, twenty-five years later, they're going. You know that tax deferment that we set up for you. You know, we want some of that money when you actually take it out. So, so now you, you've arranged your whole finances for the last 10, 15 years a at a certain way, and we're just going to change it on the drop of a dime because we're greedy. Yeah. And, and this is yet another one of those things where they say, hey, look, we're only going after the wealthy people, so don't worry about it. But, of course, in the, in the end, they're, they're almost always coming after everybody. <laughs> uh, but they, essentially they've said, I think that this is only going to impact people making over 400000 that they're not going to allow them, I think, to, to have this ability to um, essentially to redirect uh, their uh, 401k or whatever other type of uh, retirement they had into a Roth IRA after they retire. I think that's what the loophole is. Um, but, um, and so the, the, this way, all of their earnings will be tax-free after that on it. Of course, they do have to pay taxes on it when they convert it. So it's not like it's a, uh, a free ride necessarily. Well, I, I really dislike calling these things tapped loop, loopholes because they were literally purposely designed that way. It's yeah. not a loophole if the politicians who created the laws purposely designed it that way. It's the way it operates. Now, if you don't like the way it operates, that's fine. You, we can change it. But don't call it a loophole. They, they deliberately designed it so people would, would behave in a certain way to influence people's behavior. That's the reason it exists. And when people behave that way, and now later on they're going, you know, now that people are behaving that way, we don't like it very much because we just want more money. <laughs> that's, that's really all it is. It's got nothing to do with fairness. The, reason, it's, the government is looking for, for whatever money they can find, whether it's your $600 Venmo account or whether it's your retirement fund. And they, they've got us thinking that they're going to go after the rich. They've got us thinking they're going to go after the people with money. But the real money is in the middle class. That's where the real money is. And that's where the change is. <laughs> What's well, also who doesn't have the lobbyists, too. I mean, that's one of the you know, sad jokes about our whole tax system is that because it's a complex system, I mean, the, the, the tax code is so big. Think about this. I mean, every year we go to do taxes and a, a big portion of the uh, of society has to literally pay people to figure out how to pay taxes, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's such a silly concept. You know, the idea that we couldn't have just a very simple tax structure. Um, and if you keep it simple and transparent, then there, there's some side benefits to that, too. One is you know everybody is paying their quote-unquote fair share, right? I mean, the idea that if, if there aren't a ton of loopholes or, you know, all of these hidden benefits for uh, people who had lobbyists, essentially, <laughs> to put those things in there, uh, then essentially we all know that, hey, look, the guy across the street, he's paying his whatever percent he's supposed to pay. I'm paying my whatever percent. The rich guy down the, on the other side of town, he's paying his whatever percent. And everybody can feel like at least they're all, they've all got skin in the game, right? Where, whereas the current system, we pretty much have this system where if, if you have a, a big enough concentrated interest, you're going to be steering the tax code in ways that a lot of us just aren't aware of. Well, even if you don't get to steer the tax code, if you have enough money, you can pay the lawyers and the accountants to figure out the tax code that best benefits you, the yeah. way to, to organize your, your finances, organize the way you, your income go, comes and goes, organizes all that, the flow of money to minimize your impact. And why wouldn't you? 
Yeah. You know, when the average person fills out their tax form, they don't sit there and, well, except for me, they don't sit there and just do the basic calculation and just pay whatever it off. You know, those, us poor people do it because we don't want to mess with the IRS, right? But they have enough money to pay the accountants and to pay the, the lawyers, and so it actually benefits them. This complicated tax system actually benefits the rich people because they're the ones who have the money to pay for the to pay for the lawyers and the and the accountants to set it up. And the thing is, rich people, most rich people, they actually are very compliant with their taxes because they have teams of people to be compliant. It, it's the poor people and the middle class who accidentally make, you know, make mistakes or maybe they don't accidentally make mistakes. Maybe they deliberately don't report some kind of income or, or whatever. But part of the reason they don't do it is because it's mind-numbingly complicated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you think about it, the idea that we have to pay billions every year as a, as a country just to figure out how to pay what we're going to pay. I mean, if, whether you're spending 60, 70 bucks on TurboTax or if you're paying four or 500 bucks to go to H&R Block or whatever it is, um, you know, that's, that's quite a drag just trying to figure out what you have to pay. Uh, I, I, I remember, I think it was uh, Estonia or some of these others, uh, the, the leader of that country, I believe, he was sort of a Milton Friedman uh, um, uh, f fan, I guess. And he, I believe, put in a relatively flat tax in that country. And so I, I think everybody pays somewhere around like 19% or something like that. But the bottom line is it's simple. And you know, you, you don't need to have this complicated system. Just simply everybody pays and, and everybody you pays a, relative, you know, a simple amount. And if you don't make, you know, whatever, well, I'm sure they probably got it, you know, a graduated system. So the poorer you are, the less percentage you pay or something like that. But again, if there's no complexity, there's no place to hide. Yeah. But the reason we're never going to get rid of the complexity is because the complexity is where they manipulate your behavior. Yeah. Right, just like the Roth IRA, they got you to save more money, be, you know, because of their tax implications of your Roth IRA. You know, that's why they exist. If they want you to do some, you know, environmental thing, they'll put a tax credit on that environmental thing, just like they've done with the EVs, right? Mm -hmm. it, they'll, and that's how they get you to do it. But then five years later, say, hey, you took advantage of those things. We don't like it, so now we're going to take it away. And that's how these things go. And it's just. Yeah. Oddly enough, though, you, you really don't have that many politicians who are running on a simple tax code. Uh, but um, yeah, Jerry Brown here in California, when he ran for president against Bill Clinton, and this was back in, I believe, the 90s, he actually ran on a flat tax, was part of the platform he ran on. I think it was like a graduated flat tax, so you know it was a little bit progressive. But the bottom line is he wanted to simplify the tax code massively in order just to get rid of uh, a lot of this you might say corruption or whatever, but it's uh, uh, you just don't see that many who are into this, and I, I suppose that's because they're all getting paid by these lobbyists, <laughs> all the politicians. To well, and this. remember, these politicians they they like to control things, and yeah. so I, you know, a lot of it we talk about the lobbyists and the, okay, but sometimes you know I learned from what I learned during the whole AB five thing and when I ran for office was that you know the lobbyists it's kind of a tail wags the dog kind of thing because the the uh, legislatures, they'll put, propose a law that you know, no one's really interested in, and then all of a sudden the, the lobbying money comes floating in. And so in that case, is it the lobbyists paying for it, or is it the, the legislators fleecing the lobbyists? You know, which one is it? Because like with AB5, a lot of people got their exemptions after they paid their money. Yeah. You know, they weren't going to get those exemptions until they paid their money. So it wasn't like the, they wanted this law. It's like, well, this, they're going to pass this goofy law, and it's going to completely, you know, ruin my business. So I've got to go in there and, and see if I can get an exemption. And the only way to do that was to pay off, was yeah. you know, pay to play. And, and so sometimes I wonder if we think it's, if it's the lobbyists actually running the game or if it's the politicians running the game. And, you know, maybe they're each running their own game. Yeah. <laughs> and we don't like to look at it that way. It is kind of funny, too. I remember way back in the day, and I, I, I don't feel like, you know, Bill Gates has been on the, the right side of a lot of things for liberty recently, but it was funny. Or, uh, uh, quite a while back, before he got sued for antitrust by the government, he really didn't give to either side, I think, was the issue. And I think that's what got him into trouble. And so, of course, <laughs> they came after him. Yeah. And that, that made him very active in the future with, with uh, you know, paying, but, paying off well, these guys. Tech was... For a long time, tech was didn't participate in politics for a very long time, yeah. and then after after Bill Gates got you know sued by the government, all of a sudden tech is now one of the biggest lobbyists. 
Well, yeah, because if the government's going to come in and start, you know, mandating areas of your business, you have no choice but to participate. Otherwise, you're just going to get run over, even if you are Google or Facebook or, you know, because they can actually still shut you down. Yeah. And so, but we're talking about the media. Bob Costas the other day, and this one actually surprised me. Bob Costas was doing a podcast, and he talked about how the media can't just call fouls on one side. He was, you know, talking about sports, but then he somehow slid into the talk about the population in general. And he was complaining that essentially that the media, whether side it is, whether you're the left side or the right side, you only call foul. If you only call fouls on the other team, you completely lose credibility. And so as a media, you have to call the fouls like an actual referee. You know, if the guy's holding, you have to be holding. You can't say, well, that guy's holding, but the holding there was worse, so we can't talk about that holding over there. You know, the holding call that the guys had, the, you know, the drive the other team had on the drive before was, was worse than that one, so we can't call that one. No, it's still holding. You have to call the foul. But the media doesn't like doing that, right? They don't want to call fouls on their own team. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I could see the argument to say that, okay, uh, you know, you can act as sort of an advocate as long as there's an advocate on the other side, too, and then, you know, maybe the best arguments come across. The, the problem is, is that uh, most people are only seeing, you know, one advocate. It's like imagine you're in a jury and you only hear the case from the perspective of either the prosecutor or the defense, but not both. <laughs> I mean, clearly your perspective of the whole story is going to be skewed at that point. And that's sort of, I think, a big part of why we have the echo chambers that we have today. Uh, just because, uh, you know, if, if you watch Fox, it's not necessarily that they're lying to you, but it's that, you know, they're, they're telling the story uh, in a way that their viewers want to hear and maybe the stories their viewers want to hear. And the same thing is happening on MSNBC or CNN, um, although in the case of CNN, it wouldn't surprise me if they're stretching the truth a little bit more, <laughs> which is part of the reason why they're falling apart. <laughs> well, it, it's that the, the choosing the story, which stories you choose to cover. And, you know, as yourself, you have a podcast, and so, you know, you cover the world from your own perspective. But yeah. we don't, but you don't call yourself a journalist. Yeah. Right, you, you're just a guy who's hosting a podcast. I'm just a, a guy hosting a public access TV show. Right, we don't pretend to be journalists. We don't pretend to, to you know, cover the news. We cover, we cover news, but we cover the news from our perspective, and we're open about that. And I think part of the problem is many of these news organizations are no longer news organizations. Oh yeah, and so, you know they're, they're. I don't want to call them propaganda because that's it's a term that has. Negative I'll, connotation. I'll call them propaganda. <laughs> well, but, but, you know, oddly enough, if someone telling you to brush your teeth and, you know, eat your vegetables is technically propaganda, mm. but it's, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. So we, we have a negative connotation to propaganda when not all propaganda is actually negative. And so, you know, I mean, I'm a kind of a historian. I like to be specific with my words. So we'll call it propaganda for the sake of, <laughs> <laughs> for the sake of Jason. But it's, when you have this one side propagandizing and while calling yourself a news media organization or calling yeah. yourself a journalist, that's actually the problem. When you're open with about what you're coming from, when you're open that you're coming from a perspective of liberty, a libertarian mm -hmm. perspective, small L libertarian, big L, whatever it is, you're at least being honest with, with your viewers. And when you're sitting there saying, no, we're, you know, what is it? What's the Fox News one that's blatantly obvious the blatant so fox is so what is it i forget what the fox i don't even see i don't watch these things i don't even know their their taglines is any, anymore you know i forgot what their I, I used to know it but <laughs> i forgot it <laughs> but it was so blatantly like what yes. are you talking about and at least msnbc what is it lean forward or something at least it's a meaningless phrase that you know at least not pretending to be anything something they're not what we report you decide that's what the fox news was right isn't it what it, or what it used fair to be fair and balanced fair and balanced there it is yeah, yeah fair and balanced we report you decide <laughs> Uh, none of these people are true. It's, they're not trying to re give you the balanced information on the news. They're giving you the, their perspective and hoping that you don't look and check some other perspective. Yeah. Well, you know, one I used to like years ago was uh, the, the, and PBS used to have the McNeil Lair News Hour. Now it's just called the PBS News Hour. But uh, back in those days, uh, it felt like they tried to cover most topics by getting somebody from both sides and so they would they'd kick off the story and then they'd bring in a person from each side and you know it might be a congressman from each side or something like that but it, it was they could sort of have a civil discussion about it and you could feel like you heard both sides of it and I, I really appreciated that whereas it, over time it's been something like now where 
I feel like all of the, the, you could just hear the language in a lot of these different things, like whether it's NPR or something else. Um, it, just the assumptions that you hear them make as they're telling the story. Yeah, you don't even think that maybe they don't even realize they're being biased, but uh, they just, uh, you know, whether it's an economic issue or something else, uh, you can just tell by the words. And unfortunately, I don't have a concrete example off the top of my head, but it's one of those things, if you pay attention to it, you can just hear these assumptions that people make as they're doing the news uh, with the language they use, uh, and it may be about economic issues uh, and maybe whose role something is, whether it's the governments or the private sectors or something else like that, but you can just tell that some of these are just assumptions they've already made in the story, and I... I, I well, you, you brought something up about telling both sides, and that actually kind of irritates me because there's often more than two sides. There's yes, three, true. four, five sides. Yeah. And I remember as a kid where you actually used to be able to hear multiple sides, not just one or not just two. You know, now, some would get more air than others. Some would get more, you know, some would get more air and some would get taken more seriously than others. But you would actually get the crazy guy, yeah, come on to the news show and, and we'll, we'll spend two minutes telling you your opinion and we'll never hear from you again. But you at least heard them. And at least you had some respect for the news organizations that they were actually going out there and actually doing news and actually trying to inform you. Hey, here's what's actually going on in the in the population in your community. And yeah, there's some people with some pretty far out ideas, but we don't know if they're good or not. You, you get to hear them. And now we just hear whatever... I don't. I don't even want to say the newscaster wants you to decide. The producer of the show, because the newscasters probably don't have any <laughs> themselves, no actual choice about what's being put on there. That's a decision made by marketers and producers and whatever. When that was one of the funny things that came out during this uh, around the COVID time or uh, while Trump was president, um, is that some of these uh, news stations they would put together these. Uh, um, oh gosh, what do they call it? Um, montage or well, I don't know if that's quite the right word but essentially you'd see all of these different news uh, stations that were run by the same company and you'd hear the anchors all saying the exact same words so it's like they're just repeating the script that they've been given at the corporate level so yeah, even even the local interest stories they'd all talk about some some balloon party or something right even the even the feel good stories all of them would have the same feel good story and yeah. it's like well how is it that Across the whole entire nation, all these things are having the same feel-good story. But you can't go out and, and spend an hour walking the streets of your own city and finding a feel-good story in your town to actually t tell the people. You've got to give some nationalized feel-good story. Uh, that kind of stuff was really, really kind of irritating, right? Yeah. Well, you, you raised an interesting part, too, uh, when uh, you know I mentioned the news hour back with uh, McNeil Lair and how they'd have both sides, right? But um, the idea that there, that uh, like you're saying, that, that 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 sort of duopoly eliminates things like uh, libertarians and other things from ever being able to sit down at the table and give their ideas too, which just completely went over my head back then because I didn't even know what a libertarian was. <laughs> Not just libertarians, libertarians, Green yeah. Party, the, this new Ford Party was what it was from Andrew from Andrew Yang. I don't care what it is; they should all have a voice. It should all be heard, and that's, you know, quite frankly, that's one of the good things here about Access Sacramento is people do get to have a voice, you know, so that is these things about these public access and channels like this and shows like this or podcasts where people do now get to have a voice that we didn't have before, and we just have to kind of start breaking through the echo chambers. Now, speaking of breaking through the echo chambers, there may be some good news on that front because Trump or Biden, they did a poll, Trump or Biden, next president, and most Americans don't want either one of these guys, <laughs> which, quite frankly, is a bit of good news. At least the majority of Americans saying, you know, they're all just awful. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things I, I just, uh, every, every four years you say, can it get any worse? <laughs> and surprise, surprise, it always does. Maybe we should stop asking that question. You know, <laughs> can it get it? Yes, it can get worse. It can always get worse. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, it, quite frankly, I mean, it, it, this is part of my own bias, I suppose, but I, I just can't even believe what we're seeing out of the current Biden administration. I mean, things like a Ministry of Truth and the Homeland Security uh, and things, I, these are absolutely Orwellian, and it just, the, the, the places we appear to be slipping to, and the idea that, I, I guess this is really hopeful news, that maybe enough people you know, on the left don't like that idea too, I guess. I, I hope that's what it means. <laughs> Yeah, well, it, it is very disturbing that we have seen the politicization of law enforcement. We're watching where 
parents, families, people who are just going to their school board to complain are now being considered as domestic terrorists. We now had a, uh, a veterans organization who, who all they really do is prepare for disasters. That's it. Not revolution. They prepare for disasters, floods, fires, that kind of thing. And so they're ready to respond in the case of disasters. And they got investigated for domestic terrorism. And then they said, no, no, they're no trouble. But they didn't take them off the list. Yeah. <laughs> and so we've got this, this condition where the bureaucracy is... Well, what's the word I'm looking for? Incentivized to actually create more and more and more domestic terrorists, which the only way to do that is to lower and lower the standard to where anybody who doesn't say what what some bureau bureaucrat wants. When, and that was what was so disturbing about that whole Ministry of Truth thing that they wanted to do. They were calling it the, the uh, Board of Disinformation or something like yeah, that. Disinform the Board of Information Control or Disinformation Control or some goofy number. Yeah, it was yeah. even worse than the Ministry of Truth. <laughs> <laughs> As though you can be more Orwell Orwellian than Orwell. <laughs> That's the strangest thing. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, this is this is really disturbing stuff because all of these things, the stuff you talked about, about parents, uh, weaponizing the FBI, DOJ, all this kind of stuff, it all comes down to essentially you're saying things we don't like, these are ideas we don't like, and suddenly you're you're an enemy of the state. And this is, you know, really scary stuff. And, and quite frankly, maybe it's a, it's, it's a hopeful sign that enough people were taken aback by him trying to do that, that that uh, to put this in homeland security, but even so, we, we've we've found out since that point that he's already been a acting behind the scenes with social media companies to tell them what they didn't want to hear and have the social media companies black that stuff out. So as far as disinformation, and when you think about the impacts that COVID policy had on society, and how much of that was called disinformation to eliminate voices from the conversation. Literally, doctors, medical professors. I, I know uh, the, the guy Jay Bhattacharya, who's down here at Stanford, uh, he was an expert in the field, and he was saying something that didn't quite match, and uh, you know, literally guys like Fauci were trying to say, hey, we gotta get this guy. We gotta, <laughs> sound like a bunch of gangsters. You know? <laughs> Not quite rub him out, but we gotta like professionally assassinate him type of thing. <laughs> So. Yeah, and it, it's it's so insanely dangerous. Yeah, and that and as we talked about at the top of the at the top of the show, you know, free speech and the mental health of that. You know, we didn't even discuss the mental health impacts of now you can't say what you want because you might have I don't know some not just repercussions, societal repercussions, legal repercussions even, and the the disintegration of society is, is kind of what we're watching but there is some hopeful sign that maybe enough people are seeing it that you know enough it's time to enough we got to find a, a path forward and talking about finding path forwards we are just about out of time want to thank you for watching us we'll join us next week for a remote show and oh is there anything Justin? we got about 20 seconds left you got anything well, uh, if you want to hear a lot more from uh, the Liberty perspective, you can also check out the Knuckleheads of Liberty. <laughs> yeah, we do air. I th we air sometime. On, I don't even know our schedule. I think we're on Monday afternoons uh, around five o'clock. Five thirty. Five five thirty. Something like that. Okay. And, and thank you, can you check us out online too. Yeah. Thanks. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>